Let the Bible Speak with your speaker, Brett Hickey. The Holy Spirit issues forth the following words in Hebrews 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Did you catch that? Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. What an invitation, the throne of grace. You'll never receive a greater invitation than that. This is a weightier invitation than an invite to a celebrity banquet, the NCAA basketball tournament, or the governor's mansion. The Hebrew writer issues this invitation to Jewish Christians directly, and all of us who are Christians indirectly, but to those who are Jewish Christians who had grown discouraged and were having second thoughts about remaining loyal to their profession of faith. They desperately needed this reminder. But what Christian does not? We will delve into the beauties and comforts of this heartening passage. But first, enjoy our song. Deeper than the ocean and wider than the sea is the grace of the Savior for sinners like me. The Bible certainly presents a number of impressive invitations. Jesus says in Matthew 11, 28 through 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Another invitation. The master said in John 7, verse 37, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. And, of course, the invitation of Matthew 25, verse 34, Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. These incredible invitations, though, do not dwarf the invitation under consideration this morning. Again, 
The Bible says in Hebrews 4, 16, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Our family recently visited the nation's capital, but we received no formal invitation. We boldly approached the various war memorials, the Washington Monument, but these could hardly be compared to the throne of grace. We also approached the Supreme Court and the Capitol building. These, however, we, uh, we moved toward with some trepidation, in part because of the guards and in part because we felt out of place. We received no invitation and we really didn't belong there. The two places, though, in that enjoyable trip to Washington, D.C., that we came upon that most resembled any kind of a throne were the White House and the Lincoln Memorial. While we approached the Lincoln Memorial with awe, we also approached boldly. The Lincoln Memorial, of course, is a massive statue of Abraham Lincoln sitting in a massive chair. The sculpture is a massive artistic masterpiece. To give you an idea of its size, consider that Lincoln's shoes are as long as I am tall. It's not merely a matter of the man having big feet, though I suppose he did. The body is sculpted to scale so that Lincoln and the gigantic seat that he sits in are about six times their actual size. This gives the aura of a throne because here, sitting in a chair, was the President of the United States, the country which for much of its existence has been the most powerful nation in the world. Yet, though we were quite impressed with the size and the realistic appearance of this magnificent statue and the powerful large print speeches that were written on the adjacent walls, none of us felt unworthy or intimidated by walking right up to the base of the monument. Why is it that this fails to rival approaching the throne of grace? This impressive sight pales to the throne of grace because despite the amazing resemblance to our 16th president, this is just one big fancy rock. It cannot move, it cannot think, it cannot communicate, it is not alive, and it represents a mortal man. Approaching the White House, I guess, is the closest I'll get to approaching an earthly throne. But in at least three materially significant ways, this is considerably inferior to the invitation to the throne of grace. First of all, unless you set an appointment with your congressman at least six months prior to your visit, you are limited to looking at the White House several hundred feet away. You can't just walk up to and inside the White House. Why, it's heavily guarded and heavily gated. The best that we got was a visit with one of the guards and a visit with a gardener who had worked there for 37 years. The guards, uh, they carry automatic weapons. That alone makes you feel anything but comfortable. Another way in which the White House is far inferior to the great white throne is that the one sitting in the Oval Office is only a man, while the all-knowing, all-powerful Creator is sitting on the throne of grace. No sin can enter the throne room of grace, but you can hardly say, the same about the White House. And even if I were to go inside, no one would know me. No one would care anything about me. Not only is the one seated in the White House inferior, not only am I uninvited, and not only can I, can I not approach boldly, but I cannot find grace to help in time of need in the White House. But I can at the throne of grace. Let's step back and look at exactly what the Holy Spirit is telling us about prayer here in Hebrews 4, 16. Again, that first phrase, let us therefore 
come boldly. Notice that not everyone is invited. He says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. This grand invitation into the heavenly version of the Oval Office, the most sacred and the most sublime, the most extravagant and most exclusive plot, on gra plot of ground in existence can be accessed only by the Christian walking in the light. Talk about standing on holy ground. We do so when we pray. Not just anyone can enter the throne room of grace. Not everyone can expect their prayer to be heard, their prayer to be answered. The prophet tells us in Isaiah 59, verse 1 and 2, this is so important. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, your sins, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. I think there's a lot of people who don't realize that God doesn't hear every prayer. The New Testament reaffirms this teaching, this truth in James 5, verse 16. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. We find this truth echoed in 1 Peter 3, verse 12. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. He hears and answers the prayers of the righteous, not that they're sinless, but that they're striving to obey the Lord, that they're Christians. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. You see, what greases the wheel down here, money and power, education, intelligence, looks, and celebrity status, that won't even get you a peek at the throne of grace. But if you've been born of water and of the Spirit, John 3 and 5, and if you're walking in the light of God's Word, 1 John chapter 1, you're not only invited, but there's no appointment necessary because God's been expecting you. Oh, I take comfort, great comfort in that. You know, you need an appointment for the doctor. You need an appointment for some restaurants. In fact, in some places, you need an appointment even for a haircut. But to come before the most august, the most glorious being of all, the godly may just show up simply by addressing the Father in Jesus' name. And we find that truth in Ephesians 5, verse 20, Colossians 3, 17, as well as in Jesus' teaching in John 14 and 15. Cornelius' prayer is interesting. It's unique and appears at first glance to be an exception to the truths that we've just noticed. Cornelius' prayer was answered before he was a Christian, but only insofar as God gave him the opportunity to hear the truth that he was seeking. You can read about that in Acts 10. In verse 4, the Lord said to him, or rather, the Lord through the apostle, the Lord said to him, thy prayers and thine alms are come up for a memorial before God. Later in the same chapter, God granted Cornelius the opportunity to hear from a man and obey the gospel. This explains what Jesus meant by seek and ye shall find in Matthew 7, verse 7. Let's take a closer look at our text. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. According to A.T. Robertson's word pictures, this literally means let us keep on coming to. In other words, once we realize that we can go and that we are invited, let us continue to take advantage of this amazing privilege. Later we read, pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, and praying always, Ephesians 6, verse 18. It's always right. The timing is always right to pray. This is one prescription for remaining faithful to the faltering Hebrew Christians. Pray and pray always. Come boldly through the throne of grace. 
Next, let's look at this word boldly. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Other translations say, come with confidence. When we pray to God, we must come believing that God hears and will answer our prayer according to his will. James writes by inspiration, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Coming boldly, though, does not mean that we enter the throne room presumptuously or arrogantly in a cocky way, charging into the presence of God like a bull in a china closet, barking out orders or threatening the Creator's compliance with our wishes with something like, if you really love me, you'll take all my pain away. Or if you really love me, you'll give me this promotion, this race. Some people get all mixed up about prayer. Reminds me of the blunder that Mattel made some years ago with the talking dolls Barbie and G.I. Joe. They made a big mistake. They got the voice boxes in the wrong dolls. Imagine how perplexed the little boys were when they heard G.I. Joe say, let's go shop until we drop. And the little girls, when they heard Barbie say, hit the ground now, hard, hard, hard. Let's be sure that we remember who we are and let's remember who God is. W.E. Vine, in his expository dictionary of New Testament words, defines boldness here as cheerful courage. Oh, I like that. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that fitting for one given an audience by God? Cheerful courage. Spurgeon, in his sermon on the throne of grace, emphasizes how we have to come in the throne room with joy. A sister told me, this past weekend. I am enthused and happy all the time, and I can't wait to get to church. I think she's praying a lot. Every once in a while, she continued, a wave of joy sweeps over me, and I thank God over and over that I found the truth. I thank God for His Word. I thank God for Jesus. Another Christian told me essentially the same thing earlier this week. And isn't that the way it should be? Shouldn't we be praying with that spirit of rejoicing? The only bellyaching believers should be those who get food poisoning. If you're a bellyaching believer, stop your moping around. Got troubles? We all do. That's the way it is down here on earth. But remember, it could be worse, couldn't it? Don't you believe? Where's your faith in God? If you've got troubles, and you've been born of water and of the Spirit, march right in to the throne room and pour your heart out before the King of Kings. How can you not rejoice in the throne room? Now, when I brood over my burdens and fixate on my troubles, I can descend into a depressed state. But how can you keep from boosting your spirit at the throne of grace. It's early yet, but because of some of his stands on moral issues, President Obama will likely not make my top 10 presidents. But during a day when everything was going wrong with me, if I received a call from the Oval Office telling me that a helicopter would be picking me up shortly to bring me to the White House, so that our president could hear and consider granting several of my personal requests, it would be awful hard for me to keep feeling sorry for myself, to sing poor old pitiful me. Yet, with the same kind of offer, only better in prayer, and from the Lord of Lords, we somehow manage, don't we, to feel sorry for ourselves. Let us come boldly. Let us come courageously cheerful before the throne of grace. Don't miss the word therefore in this scripture. Let us therefore come boldly. 
This points to a motive for approaching the throne of grace boldly. Now, although we don't get all of that in verse 16, when we go back just one verse and read verse 15, it becomes very clear why the therefore is therefore. He says in verse 15, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, or in other words, we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. We can come boldly before the throne because we have a compassionate high priest, a merciful mediator. Oh, we need it, but we've got it. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody but my Jesus. Oh, Jesus knows all about your struggles. He knows even the taint of temptation. He was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. Temptation is degrading treatment for the Son of God, but He endured it. He knows the lust of the flesh. He also knows the deep disappointments, the aching loneliness, the power of peer pressure, the annoying irritation of mistreatment. He's felt every source and every kind of temptation. He knows it all. That's why, listen, we need not be ashamed or embarrassed to bring our weaknesses, our troubles, into the throne room of grace. What a powerful, what a beautiful scripture. Folks, that's what he's there for. Listen to the end of the scripture, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's there in prayer to help. Oh, there's no place for grace like the throne of grace. Where do you go for help in time of need? I hope you don't think that you can count on the president and Congress, the governor, the mayor, to solve all your problems. Where do you go for help in time of need? The family, friends, physicians, the pharmacy, fishing, food, the Fido. These can offer us some comfort, but the world has these too. We can also find some relief in music, good books, sports, and some television programs. But these are no substitute for the throne of grace. They pale in comparison. So how do you get the most of going boldly through the throne of grace? It's true that God is no respecter of persons, but here's the secret that some have never understood. God is a respecter of attitudes and behaviors. Hear the Holy Spirit in James 4, verse 6 through 10. But he gives more grace. There it is, grace, favor. We all want it. How do we get it? He says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There's no grace for the proud, but there is favor given those with a meek and humble attitude. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. There's the behavior and there's more to follow. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Don't be proud. Don't be too proud to submit to the Lord. We have more after the song. As I walk the road of life, my feet grow weary, and I stumble through the thorns and shifting sand. But I never had a fear about tomorrow.
soon shall stand. And I'll never walk alone, for my heart tells me I'll be led by the Master's hand. Through the storm, through the night, I'll keep Thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak. We pray that you have heard God speak to you through His Word. If you'd like to get a copy of this sermon, Throne of Grace, please write us at the address on your screen and we'll be glad to get it out to you. You may also request a free Bible study course that you can complete at home. If that interests you, please let us know. We are also interested in your questions and comments. And in future programs, we will address those questions if we don't address them by mail. Please visit our website, letthebiblespeak.com, if you have the internet, and watch videos of the program at your convenience. On behalf of the congregations listed shortly, we echo the sentiment of the Apostle Paul when he wrote in Romans 16, verse 16, the churches of Christ salute you. Until next week, goodbye and God bless.